Well, good evening, and welcome to our Wednesday night uh, prayer time, Bible study time, and uh, I hope that you've been encouraged and uh, and been uplifted through our times together, and we're going to keep doing this. I, I do want to share with you an announcement tonight uh, of kind of how we're going to do things moving forward. Uh, we have been wanting to, to do more in-person, you know, Bible study and uh, have some interaction in that way, but we also recognize that many of you that are watching this on Wednesday nights uh, do not feel comfortable uh, coming to public worship right now because of, of underlying health issues and things like that. And we completely understand that, so we're trying to figure out how to do both. So we think we've got it figured out. So next Wednesday, our plan is, is we're going to be doing our Bible study prayer time at 630, but we're going to be doing it both in person and we're going to be live streaming it. Uh, we've been working with Luke on this. We still got to uh, uh, do a little, a few trial runs, make sure everything is working right. Uh, but our plans are, if you want to join us in person at 6.30, we'll be meeting in the sanctuary so we can spread out a little bit if we need to. But we're also going to live stream our prayer time and Bible study at 6.30. For those of you who need to watch it on Facebook or YouTube, uh, you can continue to do that. So you can do one or the other. We've got our, our children's program uh, on Wednesday nights. Our youth program on Wednesday nights right now is going strong. Uh, we do have some parents that are bringing their children and uh, grandparents that are bringing their children, and it would just be convenient for them uh, to have a Bible study going on in person. And so we're going to be uh, uh, doing that. And then also some of you just, just wanting to get together and study God's Word. In a, in a safe way, and so uh, we're going to offer you that either way. So if you want to continue watching us uh, on our live stream on Wednesday nights on Facebook or YouTube, it will be available at 630, but if you want to join us in person and you feel comfortable in doing that, we'll be meeting in the sanctuary at 630, and we'll be live streaming that uh, from our, our sanctuary then. So that's our plans for next Wednesday. Uh, we'll be announcing that on Sunday as well and, and uh, looking at some other things, you know, with our small groups, with our Sunday school, especially with our children that we've been praying through, working through, still got a, uh, a few more uh, things to, to look at, uh, but we want to do that as soon as possible as well. But next Wednesday, that's how we'll be doing it. So uh, looking forward to that. Uh, also, our prayer list, we will have it available uh, next Wednesday for those of you that come. We'll have some printouts of that, but we will continue to make our prayer list available online as well. If you want to get an updated prayer list, matter of fact, uh, tonight we have one. And so you can uh, go to our website and click the announcements page there, and there'll be an updated prayer list just like we have every Wednesday. And so you can uh, get that and be praying uh, for those people. Speaking of prayer requests, let me update you on a few things. Do have a praise report. And as you're watching this in the comment section, if you have a praise, feel free to share that. Uh, but uh, Brianna and Tyler Dolan have a little baby girl now. Uh, she was born last Thursday. Mia is her name. She was eight pounds, one ounce, and uh, and everything is going well there. And so uh, thankful for that. Uh, be praying for little Mia. Be praying for Brianna. Uh, and Tyler as well, and uh, just thankful uh, for this new life. We also have some prayer requests I want to update you on. Uh, I apologize during the first service Sunday. I for, uh, just forgot to mention these. I uh, thought about it as soon as the service was over, but it was too late then. But uh, many of you have been praying for Josh Statham. Uh, last Saturday, uh, buried his mother there. Uh, as she died and went home to be with the Lord. And so just continue to pray for Josh and, uh, and Tracy and their family and uh, keep them in your prayers. But also uh, Norman Lovelady's uh, father went home to be with the Lord last week, last Thursday. Uh, and so be praying for them. Now his dad had COVID and was in the hospital in North Mississippi in Tupelo there. And I had to be put on life support and, and passed away in the midst of uh, spending time with his dad and and wanting to be with him, uh, uh, Norman and his mom have also contracted COVID, and so Norman's not feeling well uh, right now. Hopefully, uh, by the time you're watching this, he'll be feeling better and doing better uh, with that, because the plans are, uh, if they're all clear and everything, is that they're going to have a funeral service in Sullivan, that's where his mom and dad lived, uh, on Sunday, uh, 
October the 4th. Uh, they'll be having that at uh, having a visitation time from 12 to 2 and the funeral service at 2. Uh, and so uh, don't know if the family will be accessible then, but uh, that's their plans uh, for October the 4th. And so just keep that family in your prayers. This has been a very difficult time for them uh, going through the process of grieving with these other complications as well. And uh, just, just lift them up in prayer. Uh, also, just want to be praying for our nation and uh, everything that is going on uh, around us and uh, and praying for, for genuine revival. And I do want to encourage you in this way as we, as we pray for revival. Understand this. We're praying for God to revive us. The way our nation will change is when God's people change. And the reason so many things have happened in our nation over the last several years and, um, and going back 20, 30, 40 years is because we, the people of God, have not done what we should do. We have not been the ministers and the witnesses that we should be. We've not walked with God like we needed to be in humility and in dependence upon him. And that's why Second Chronicles seven fourteen says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves. That's us. If we will humble ourselves and if we will pray and if we will turn from our wicked ways, then God will hear. He'll forgive. And he'll heal our land. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Well, we do a bow before you. Lord, I thank you for uh, somewhat of a, of a spiritual awakening that has happened on the, among your people. Lord, I, I pray that that awakening would be genuine and we wouldn't just look at others and say shame on them, but we allow the light of your Holy Spirit, the light of your righteousness to shine upon us and that uh, we would respond to the conviction of your whole of the holy spirit in our own lives and we would turn we would repent we would humble ourselves before you and get our hearts our lives right with you because this nation will never be a righteous nation if your people are not a righteous people if your people are not effectively praying and ministering and loving and witnessing like we should. Lord, we need to get our hearts right. And I thank you for your word that speaks very clearly and tells us how we ought to live. And as we study your word tonight, Lord, I pray that you would help us to see. Our eyes have been blinded. Our hearts have been hardened. Lord, soften our hearts tonight. Give us ears to, e to hear and eyes to see what you have for us and how you want us to live in these days, in these troubling times. Lord, we know that trouble comes in all forms, and Lord, we do lift up these that are struggling. We thank you for the, uh, the blessing of new life and for uh, putting little Mia in a Christian home with, with Tyler and with Brianna there, and I know she's going to grow up learning about you, and we pray your protection uh, upon her but Lord as life comes life also uh, ends and um, that's always tough even when we know our loved ones are with you just knowing that we won't see them again until we we stand before you Lord uh, that's a that may be a while and so we we miss those that we love and so Lord I pray for for Josh and Norman and their families uh, the the grandchildren there, uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, wrap your arms around them and comfort them and strengthen them. I pray especially for Norman and and Amy and Lord for uh, also Norman's mom as she's dealing with the sickness as well. Lord, I pray that you'd heal them and that you'd strengthen them that they might uh, be able to go through this grieving process in a way that they get get not only closure but that they get comfort and strength. Uh, from you, from your people, from in, in, the encouragement of, of seeing others and hearing from others. 
Uh, Lord, that can really go a long way. You use that. And so, Lord, I pray you'd use whatever means necessary to carry them and to strengthen them through this time. And, Lord, I thank you for the gift of your word and the comfort that it brings, also the conviction that it brings. And whatever it is we need tonight, Lord, I pray that your word would expose that and do that work. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now let's uh, open up God's Word to Psalm 119, digging back into this rich, uh, long uh, psalm that uh, deals with God's Word and with God, and so uh, excited to be able to, to look at this. And so Psalm 119, we're going to begin in verse 137, uh, getting closer and closer to the end, but it's not just about ending these verses or ending this chapter, but I want us to get uh, everything that we can from this. And and. It may seem like this has taken a long time because of all these verses, but there's a lot of nuggets that I hadn't really dug up, you know, in the midst of this, that we could have, uh, we could have gone a lot slower with this. But, but I'm wanting to cover a section at a time so we can move through this. And, and so let's look at this, these eight verses here in Psalm 137 through 144 as he starts off and says, uh, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. Your testimonies, which you have commanded, are righteous and very faithful. My zeal has consumed me because my enemies have forgotten your words. Your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. Trouble and anguish have overtaken me, yet your commandments are my delights. The righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding, and I shall live. Do you see the theme in those verses? We, Matter of fact, there's one word that was mentioned uh, several times there. Five times there's a reference to being righteous or the righteousness of God in his word. He starts off in verse 137 and says, Righteous are you, O Lord. He says in verse 138 that your testimonies are righteous and very faithful. In verse 142, he says, Your righteousness is ever is an everlasting righteousness. And, and then he says in verse 144 again, The righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. So that's five different times uh, that same word is used. He also in this passage he talks about the uh, the word being upright and faithful and and pure. And so there's this theme of righteousness, and it's not just in these verses, but it is all throughout God's word. Uh, being righteous, living a righteous life—that's the life that God has called us to. He talks about how Noah was a righteous man. He he talks about how Job was an upright and 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 righteous man, and and talks about the kings, the ones that did not do uh, righteously, and the ones that that did what was right. And and uh, we read about that in the Old Testament, the New Testament. Uh, we read, matter of fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter five that our righteousness should exceed the righteousness of the of the of the fries of the <laughs> of the Pharisees and the scribes I guess I was putting all them together in one group uh, the Pharisees and the the scribes there in Ephesians chapter 6 Paul t- talks about putting on the breastplate of righteousness and in a lot of Paul's writings he talks about pursuing righteousness and living a righteous life and how important that was uh, and still is today for the church in the midst of an unrighteous world, how we're called to live a righteous life. And here in this passage, we see a, a connection between living a righteous life and the righteous word of God. When he talks about righteousness, this is a, a very descriptive word in the Old Testament in the Hebrew language. It's the word sedek. And it is that idea of the, of the plumb line. Uh, that that's what it means to be righteous. It's the you know what a plumb line is. It's a it's a string with a weight on it, and and when it is still and not swinging and stuff, it gives you something that is truly upright. That is truly uh, uh, according to the gravity is is truly up and down, not leaning one way or the other. It was the way, and and some uh, uh, carpenters even today use it to 
to line up a fence or to line up a wall or something like that. Because if you get it out of out of whack, then the wind can uh, can blow it down or weight can maneuver it, and and it's going to collapse. If you've ever you know built things with blocks and stuff like that, it's so important that you get it straight up and down. Because if it starts leaning a little bit one way or the other, and you put some weight on that, it's going down. And so that's what the plumb line was. It, it was something that was perfectly straight up and down. It's the idea of of living that straight life where there is no wavering, no going back and forth in our in our walk with God. Uh, that's the the picture uh, of righteousness, of being plumb, of of lining up with God's standard. Uh, no wavering in our life, and so that's what he means by this this uh, this word righteous here, and, and it's found all throughout this passage of scripture. So the first thing I want us to look at tonight is our righteous God. He, he says there in verse one thirty seven, he says, "Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments." And so that's where righteousness starts. It starts with a God who is righteous. He is the standard of righteousness. You know, uh, uh, the Bible, especially the Old Testament and the New Testament as well, makes this very clear that God is a righteous God. He is perfect in everything that He does. He does not waver. He does not make mistakes. He does not uh, get away from His character or from what is right. He always does what is right. He is righteous in everything that He does. You know, uh, in, in some ways today, and I'm not talking about contemporary uh, or anything like that, sometimes through our legalism and uh, through our own selfish living, uh, we have lost some of the majesty and glory of, of who God is and how great uh, He is, uh, the majesty and glory of this God of Scripture and how perfect and how righteous He is. You know, Moses and, uh, and the children of Israel, Moses demonstrated that and and, uh, and how when he got with God and, and how the standards that God had for worship and for uh, his people, uh, David, you know, uh, understood the righteousness of God. And David strayed away from that, but he had to be brought back to that. You know, when the, we, we studied the temple in Second Chronicles, how when it was built and how the glory of God filled the temple and such that the priests couldn't stand to worship. They had to come out because God was perfect and they were not. God was holy and they were not. God was righteous and they were not perfectly righteous in what they did. And then even the, the New Testament as well. We, we mentioned Paul and, and how he calls the, the church, the bride of Christ, to live a righteous life. It even gives us some some insight into how to, to do that. And then you look at the book of Revelation and how it talks about uh, the, the worship of God, how we worship Him in righteousness and in holiness, how He is a... Because the blood of Christ, we're able to come into His presence, but yet we come uh, in awe of, of who He is. And what is it that the, the angels around the throne describe? We see it in Isaiah 6. We see it in Revelation. What do they say? They say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He is holy, which is another word that means He is righteous. See, what we mean by that, what it means when it says the the that the Lord is righteous. Righteous are you, O Lord. It doesn't mean that he measures up to a standard. It means that he is the standard. It isn't that he lines up with some standard of right and wrong perfectly. He is the standard that everybody else must line up with. God is the standard. He is the plumb line. You understand that? It isn't that uh, the reason murder is wrong, the reason lying is wrong, the reason adultery is wrong is not just some moral code and that God agrees with that. God is the moral code. He is the one that said, the giver of life, He is the author of life, and He is the one that says taking another life is wrong because He's the one that gives life. He is the God of truth who never lies. So he is the one that has said that falsehood, lying in whatever form it is, is wrong. He is the one that is always faithful. 
who loves us and will never stop loving us. And he is the one that has said unfaithfulness, adultery is wrong. You see, he is. The reason all those things are wrong is because they do not measure up to him, to his heart, to his character, to his ways. They are against what he has said and against who he is. God is the standard. He is the plumb line. Righteous are you, O Lord. And not only is God the standard, but God is the eternal standard. He, we, we read that over in verse 142 where he says, Your righteousness, who you are, living this righteous life, setting this standard, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. God does not change. His standards do not change. What he says does not change. How he works does not change. What he allows does not change. It is impossible for God to be wrong because he is the standard. It's not just that he measures up to it. He is that standard and he is that eternal standard. Everything he does, everything God has done, is doing, and will do is right. And because it is him that is doing it, it is good. It is good. It's not good because we say it is good. It is good because he does it. And it's not right because we say it's right. Or any man says that it's right. It is right because he is always right. He is the standard for righteousness. He is the standard for what is good. He is a righteous God. Do you understand that? Do you understand that, that his righteousness is not subjective? It is objective. He is always right. And everything that he says in the word of God is always right. That's the next point. It's not only the righteous God, but it is his righteous word. This word is perfect in everything that it says because it comes from a perfect God. It is righteous because it comes from a righteous God. God has given us his word. And it is perfect in every way. It is perfect in the facts that are displayed here and the truths that are shared in the, the history and the science and everything uh, that is mentioned here. It is perfect in, in those facts. It is also perfect in its instruction. It works. It is it, When we apply it to our lives, it proves to be true. It is righteous, his righteous word. Just look at how it's described uh, here in this passage, how his word is described. First of all, in verse 137, we see that it is described as being upright. His word is upright. It says, righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. By being upright, it means that it goes straight. This is a different word from the plumb line. And really what it means is it matches up with the plumb line. The word of God does is that it, it lines up with God. It goes straight. God is the standard, and the word of God lines up with that standard perfectly. His testimonies, his judgments, his word is upright. It is, it is right. Not only that, but his word is faithful. In verse 138, it says, Your testimonies which you, have com uh, which you have commanded are righteous and very faithful. Very faithful. It is faithful. That means it is certain. It does not wave. It is, it is firm in being right. It never goes out of plumb. This word, we can trust it, what the word of God says. There is not one phrase not one word that wavers, that doesn't match up with who God is and what he desires and what he has said. It is, it is faithful to God. It is faithful to who he is. It lines up perfectly. It is solid in that. And notice what he says. He doesn't just say it's faithful. He said it is very, very faithful, more so than anything else in life, more so than God's people. God's, God's people, we're supposed to line up with him, but we don't always line up with him. But the word of God will. The, the, the people that write books, there are, there are some great books that are out there, and God has used them in my life. But they, they will not always match up with God. But his word, the Bible, always will. There are some great preachers out there. Uh, you may know one or two, uh, but there are some that God has used in my life to to, to impact my life, and, and God has spoken truth into my life, but, but every preacher is just a man, 
and we're 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 human and and we don't always say everything perfect sometimes we talk about fribes and <laughs> fribes and Pharisees you know as <laughs> as scribes and Pharisees we we don't say things right and even even doctrinally even morally we can say things that are wrong but not God's word God's word is very faithful not only that but it's also pure that's another word that he uses. Look in verse 140 where he says, your word is very pure. There's that word very again. It's not just pure, it is very pure. Uh, and this word for the pure there is the picture of the refiner's fire heating up the metal. And after you, you remove the dross, what do you have? You have pure metal. That's what this word pure is. In other words, that this word of God, it doesn't have dross in it. The dross there's not any dross in it. It is just the, the pure word of God. It is everything that we need. There is no dross. And when we go through the fires, the refiner's fire, when we go through the trials of life, the word of God goes with us and the word of God survives it. It doesn't burn up because there's not dross. It lasts through every trial, every tribulation, every hardship, every storm. The word of God is true and righteous and speaks righteousness into our lives in the midst of it. That's, that's powerful. I'm so thankful for the Word of God. It also, the Word is, is truth. He says uh, there in verse 142, he says, Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. We talked about that. And then he says, And your law is truth. He doesn't just say it's true. It said it is true. It is, it is real. It is consistently real. It is for real life. It is righteous in in its application, and as we apply it, it will lead us to, to live a righteous life as well. It is true in content, yes, but it's also true in application uh, as well, application to our lives. When we read, we're reading through Jeremiah right now. Brother Matt and I were talking about this and how, you know, Jeremiah talks about those things. He's not talking about the United States in 2020 but the application is there. He's talking to the nation of Israel and what the nation of Judah and what they were going through when he talks about their spiritual adultery and their idolatry and, uh, and the judgment and the accountability with that and the, and the opportunity for mercy and forgiveness in the midst of that. And that applies to us today in, in our idolatry. We have strayed. We have put other things before God. And we will be held accountable for that. And God, that's part of what we're going through now, I think, is part of, of God trying to, to wake us up and, and where we will return to Him. And we can return just like they could return. And we can find mercy just like they See, the Word of God is righteous. It is truth. And it, it is true in its application. And then it's everlasting as well. Just as God is everlasting, the truth of God's Word, the righteousness of God's Word is everlasting as well. Verse 144 says the righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. Not only God's righteousness is everlasting, but his word is everlastingly righteous as well. It is always true. It is always righteous. It always works. It always applies. It is the same for all people of all times. Jeremiah's word was true for the nation of, of Judah in Jeremiah's day. It was true for the, the nation of Israel in Jesus' day. It was true for the people, the church in the first century. It was true for people in the 1700s, and it's true for us today. It is an everlasting truth, everlastingly right. So we don't need to change the Word of God. We need to let the Word of God change us because the Word of God is righteous because God is righteous and He has given us His righteous Word. So now we get to the third truth and that is the righteous path. We have a righteous God who's given us His righteous Word so that He can make us righteous. That's the righteous path that we're talking about. You see, the Lord is a relational God. He's not just about abstract truth. He's about giving us his word and working in our lives so that 
He can do, He can make us righteous. He wants to impact our lives. That's right. God is not just up there just saying, I'm righteous, so everybody bow before me. No, He wants to work in our lives and make us righteous, especially because sin has, has made us unrighteous. He is willing to do that work, and He not only wants to, to cleanse us from our sin, but He wants us to help us overcome sin as well. That's why He's given us His Word. So let's, let's look at it. I want us to look, first of all, I want us to look at the, the plan here. Uh, just some, some truths here in this song. Notice in verse 137, we talked about it. He, he says, Righteous are you, O Lord. So who is it that is righteous? It's God that is righteous. I'm not righteous. I, I want to be righteous. I need to be righteous to stand before, but I'm not. Righteous are you, O Lord. God is righteousness. And so as we recognize God is righteous, and it's not us that are righteous, that we need a work in our lives. This is, this is the plan. And so what does he say there in, in verse 144? He says, "Your righteous, the righteousness of your testimony is everlasting. And then he says what he says, give me understanding and I shall live. He's not talking about breathing as opposed to not breathing. He's talking about living the righteous life, living a life that is plumb. He says, God, you're plumb. You are the standard. I don't measure up. So give me understanding. Give me, I, I need your help in living this life. This is the plan. We need the help of God. And so what does God do? God works in our life to make us righteous. The Word plays a role in that. The righteous Word of God. It is not only righteous, but it applies, it is truth, and it applies to us and leads us in how we are to live righteous. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say righteousness is not something we can do without God. Righteousness is not an achievement. It's not a, uh, a special effort that we must give, that, that we just must grit our teeth, and if we try hard enough, then we can live this righteous life. No, righteousness is a gift. God is righteous. We are not. Lord, help me. Help me. That's, that's the attitude of the psalmist. Righteousness is a gift of God. He is the one that makes us righteous. That's what the book of Romans in the New Testament is all about. Um, just one passage, Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, as he says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, that word justified means made righteous. Matter of fact, some translations have that, having been made righteous by faith. God makes us righteous. Now, because he, when He makes us righteous, we can have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we can glory in tribulations. That's where we are, right? Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character, hope, all these things flow from God making us righteousness and now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given us. We have been made righteous and we have been given the Holy Spirit to live a righteous life. That, that's what that's the whole thing about righteousness. That is God's plan. He's righteous. We're not. He is the one that makes us righteous. He makes us positionally righteous, righteous before him as through the death on the cross and the resurrection, our sin is forgiven, our sin is removed, our crookedness that where we have gone astray, it has been forgiven. And, and not only has our crookedness been removed, but we have been made straight. We have a practical righteousness through the Holy Spirit. Romans 5 was talking about the Holy Spirit that has been given us. We have a new heart. We have a new spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. And, and, and the Holy Spirit works working in us, makes us holy, teaches us how to live this holy life. That is what Jesus does for us. Jesus is the one that over, can overcome temptation. Jesus is the only one who can live a righteous life. He's the only one that has lived a righteous life, and we need him to live it through us. That's the plan. 
The Word of God reveals that plan. The Word of God corrects us when we get off of that plan. The Word of God uh, uh, helps and reveals things to us and shows us that. So we have the plan. And then here's the pattern. Here's what the psalmist is talking about. So what do we need? We just need to live humbly before him, dependent upon him. Notice how he's, he's described here uh, with these things, um, how he describes his relationship with God. This is his position. He says, you know, I'm, I have a, a passion that you've given me. As he says in verse 139, my zeal has consumed me. Because my enemies have forgotten your word. You see, he's this this word for passion is kind of like a jealousy. And basically what he's saying is, I don't have any other rivals. Matter of fact, it upsets me when people turn away from you because you are my first love. I've not left my first love. I have a passion for you, for pleasing you, for honoring you, for living this life. So I'm dependent upon you. I need you. There's a passion. There's a service, a heart of a, of a servant there. In verse 140, as he says, your word is very pure. Therefore, your servant loves it. I am your servant. I am I am bowing before you. I surrender all my rights to you. I'm 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 bound to you. I am um, in bondage to you. It is a privilege to serve you. It's the desire of my heart to serve you. I love you. And then there's this humility in verse 141. He says, I am small and despised. I can't do this on my own, but I do not forget your precepts. Your precepts, you tell me to live a righteous life, and I can't do it on my own. So, Lord, I'm asking you to help me. That's the attitude of humility. I am nothing. I can't do this without you. I never have been able to do this without you. I need you. And that that humble attitude, it's revealed in hardship. Pride is revealed revealed in hardship and the hard times that we go through are we humbly bowing ourselves dependent living a dependent life upon him and then there's this delight my delight is not found in achieving things and impressing others my delight is found in you and in your word verse 143 he says trouble and anguish have overtaken me yes yet your commandments are my delight i'm surrendered to you my joy is not found in my circumstances. My joy is not found in prosperity. My joy is found in you and in your word. I have nothing, but I have delight and I have joy because I have you. You. That's where the power to live a righteous life comes from. It's from a life of humble dependence and a heart of a servant that loves God before everything else. So we depend upon Him. We need Him. Living a plum life, living a righteous life, doesn't mean just lining up my life and everything I do. It just means lining up our heart and lining up our passion with Him. And when your heart is lined up with His heart, and everything else will fall in line. Let me pray for us. God, I do pray that you'll line up our heart with you. That our desires might line up with your desires. And that our life might line up with your life. Not through self-effort and not for selfish gain but just out of love and adoration for you. You told the people of Israel to live a righteous life, and you said this is what it looks like, to love you with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. I pray that our heart would line up with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's live a righteous life with our hearts lined up with God. We're praying for you. We can help you in any way. Let us know. God bless you.